Hey there, welcome back. Uh, when someone says, do you want us to bring the International Space Station to you? What would you expect other than the International Space Station in my studio? This is Brian, what's up, Brian? Hey, yeah. let's do it. There it yeah. is, okay. Happy Brian, who who are you and why is there a space station in my, in my studio here? Well, there's the space station here because myself and some of my friends, uh, we work in the space biz. Our day jobs are supporting the real version of this, but we couldn't get enough of that and decided that we wanted to connect other people to what's going on in space. What people don't realize, like this isn't just some crazy, massive 3D printed thing. This is the ISS Mimic. And so what we see now is what the actual space station in space looks like. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and in many elements, and we're trying to add more all the time, we're in real time updating the configuration of the space station, in particular, the solar arrays. The angles of the solar arrays are getting a live feed from the actual space station, so they are mimicking the space station in real time. A live feed. Well, maybe 10 to 15 seconds behind. <laughs> there you go. But there still, go. a live, the space station is sending out a live feed of telemetry. Correct. You are consuming this. Yes and telling this Mimic space station to then perform the same moves. That's right. Kind of the inspiration here was that data we're actually tied into is part of a public data stream. So many of us have worked in the industry for a long time. Uh, we get access to this data behind a firewall where we log in with our credentials. But uh, years ago, NASA released a lot of this data publicly. Public. 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 So that was really the inspiration for this project is what can we do with this public data stream to connect people to what's going on in space? Uh, you know, we love the apps. We love, we love YouTube. Aww. Aww. We, we love too. what's going on. Yeah. You know, all the things that are available to people that are already NASA geeks. But we also wanted something that's sort of in your face and obtrusive but is also true to life, replicating the space station in real time. So that, yeah, that's really, that was really the start. It boggles my mind because, you know, I, I follow at Spot the Station or whatever, and when it comes over the Seattle area right, right. and it's nighttime, like I remember drinking with a friend at a pub and we looked and we're like, in five minutes, it's gonna be over. And that's so right. beers in hand, we ran out to the street with other people who also knew about this and we just stared up into the heavens and the space station went over our heads and like we toasted to it. It was a joyous occasion. There you go. But actually that brings up another point. So while, while we have worked on this, many of us our whole careers worked on the space station, we see it maybe in parts or we see it digitally, but we don't get to see it in person except when it's the little dot flying over. We celebrate that too. But there's a part of us that would like to see it physically. We have lots of models. We have the Lego models we all do. We love that one too. But something that's more representative of the real thing and you know, we just can't get over the, over the live data coming through. Representative of the physical shape of the space station, but then changing its shape based on this public data stream. Exactly. So now let's, let's talk about that data stream. Is it just like a continuously updated JSON string? Uh, yes, it's a JSON. It's uh, using a light streamer server and then show it on the screen. So we're using a Raspberry Pi for that. That's perfect, Raspberry right? Raspberry Pi, yeah, yeah. And then the Raspberry Pi, um, right, in addition to running the display, it also sends commands to our, all our Arduinos, which then control the motors to, to make them spin and be in the right position. So Arduinos with motor shields. Or with motor shields, Motor that's shields, right. and yeah. then all connect up to a Raspberry Pi that's, right. that's receiving the data and then instructing it on how to move. Yep. This is brilliant. When we talk about space travel and trying to get people interested in it, obviously the International Space Station is something that people love, but being able to give something like this to someone who might show an interest in space and then have it mimic what the actual station is doing, this must be great for instructors and teachers. That's why we made it the way that we did. So if we were going to do just one, just for us, we would have, you know, we would have used the, the CAD that we have access to and, and those kinds of things that are sort of protected and we could just keep it at work. But we want this, this is open source. This is a 100% open source project. Yes, 100% open source. And like many things open source, we want help developing it, please help. <laughs> but we've gotten off to, yeah, so we've, we've used CAD, publicly available CAD. We're using Raspberry Pi and Arduino because those are commonly used in education. And a primary goal, the primary goal, is, is to make this available for educators. 
Meaning, okay. meaning educators, so this, like someone making this model or the educators working with the students and building it themselves. So there's two ways. Our favorite way is students build this with their educators because a lot of the technology you're use, learning, you're learning coding, uh, you're learning electronics, mechatronics, putting it together, things not working, things kind of going haywire and trying to figure out why. So those are all skills that we want people to experience. But frankly, whether or not they decide to become an engineer or scientist, I just think it's fun to have some time to, to sort of play in this domain. Oh, I could see this easily being something that inspires the next class of, of, of engineers. Especially because I think you're gonna be able to manipulate some buttons yeah. here sure. and make should it dance a bit. I think we should. So right now it's it's been moving this whole time. The whole just, time. just very small movement. That's if right. people scrub back and forth, they'll be able to see it. But now we're going to are we gonna fast forward sure. or replay or well, what's, what's... First I'll show, so we have a bunch of data screens um, and this is all again, all done on Raspberry Pi. This is Python and Kivi, if you've heard of that. Uh, if you have or haven't and wanna create your own data screens, we would love to have your help. <laughs> I need help. Um, this is some of the data that we're using. You'll notice, for instance, um, the joint angles changing very slowly. What is a joint angle? Ah, thank you for that. So these are the solar panels and they're tracking the sun. Um, they're rotating continuously. All the power that's used by the space station comes from the sun. So when we're going around the Earth, the station orbits every 90 minutes. So it's about 45 minutes of daylight and then 45 minutes of darkness. So with half the time, we don't have daylight and we're using batteries. So a lot of what we're seeing here is the voltage state of those batteries. And so right now, if I go back, I can see where we are in the orbit and we must be in the sun. Here we are. In fact, we're about to go into a shadow phase. We have a number of different screens. I'm not gonna go through them all, but we can show when we're transmitting, where we're transmitting. Uh, we have GNNC data that shows when uh, the CMGs are getting close to saturation. What's it's a CMG? <laughs> control moment gyro. Okay. So that's something that helps keep the station orienting the same way, even as it's going around the earth or even as there's external loads. That... I see, okay. So another thing we can do, since this is slow, we have some recorded data that we can play back at an accelerated rate. So we can play this back at 60 times normal speed. And this is the data we're playing back from how long ago? Uh, this is from a few years ago. So this okay. is an autonomous cargo vehicle, HTV vehicle uh, coming to station. Oh, right? bringing, okay. Bringing some supplies and some fresh food oh. for the astronauts. Okay, so these are turning because at the time this is being replayed, it's just they're focused or they're, they're being turned towards the sun. That's right, towards the sun. And you'll see later it'll change. So if you can imagine it's coming up to dock, so sometimes you'll see these and they'll turn edge on towards the vehicle as the, as in kind of oh. the approach angle to minimize, they call it feathering. Okay. Feathering to minimize, here we go, feathering for me. So to minimize the amount of uh, impact on the I see. Station. Okay, so then in that data, then it turns things, once, once the Dragon capsule has docked, then it's able to manipulate the solar panels, turn them back to the sun and, and get Resume. all the power yes. that it needs. Yes, that's right, that's right. And so it's just, as it goes around the Earth, it's just in a continual state of 45 minutes charge, 45 minutes discharge. That's right. 45, and so, But the LEDs actually indicate the charge state. So you'll see some of these turning red, that means we've gone from sun into shadow. So red means you're discharging, and blue is charging, and then white is fully charged. And so if you see them all white, you'll know we're probably near the end of a of a sunny sunny side of the 45 minutes we're oh. probably going to go into shadow pretty soon oh oh so the, part of the reason why the solar panels are so large is to collect as much of that sun as possible every 45 minutes that's right and in fact it used to be not that many years ago we only had sort of these larger ones you see the little ones in front yeah these are the rollout solar arrays so these are an addition that nasa added actually boeing had a big part in adding those because we're extending the life of station. This allows us to continue doing lots of science without having a power restriction on what can be done. Has did In doing this project, was there anything that surprised you? Well, I'd actually say, there, yeah, there were surprises both ways. So some problems that I thought would be somewhat trivial were quite hard, and okay. some that I thought would be hard were pretty easy. What was one that was you thought would be hard but ended up being fairly easy? So back to the solar panel. So all the power is generated out here on these ends, mm -hmm. and, but this is a continuously rotating mechanism. And we have to get that power across this continuously rotating joint, right? Okay. So if you just have wires and you're oh, yeah, spinning they'll, them. They'll twist they'll to twist infinity and, and then yeah, bad, things and bad things happen. Bad things happen. 
so what, what the space station uses is some, so this is what's in here. Um, it uses what's called a slip ring, which is very similar oh, to this one okay. that we got off Amazon for twenty dollars. And so what, what it, this one allows you to do is it's it's got some ring copper rings in there that pass data and uh, power across the different channels. So the, the colors on each side, you know, tell you what's passing through. Oh, so, so Amazon Prime just delivered to the space station, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they paid a little more than twenty dollars for theirs. I hope so. A little, little more capable <laughs> and a little more power. But that was a that was quite an easy solution for that putting those in there. One other was actually the 3D printing. So 3D printing has actually been more capable than I thought it would be. So for instance, there's a gear in here. This is all PLA, so we've printed it all in PLA because we want this to be as accessible as possible. Sure. For instance, in this case, um, this is a 3D printed gear, and it's much like the what's called the bull gear on the actual space station, where this giant 10 foot, 10 foot diameter ring on the space station has gear teeth cut in it all the way around, and uh, pinion is what turns that and makes it oh, makes see. it turn. So we three D printed one. Uh, actually, Craig came up with the design, and it worked the first time. <laughs> it worked the first time. That's we like, great. And, and then we thought it's going to wear out, and they've never worn out. This being a mimic, are there times when you would prototype a possible solution or addition? on something like this or are there are there other other ways of doing that so i'll say this is a great visualization tool ah, that's, that's okay. what we've heard from a lot of people okay. we actually had it inside mission control in the mission evaluation room and then we were like well let's let it stay a little longer and then we got to have it in there mimicking live during the first uh, all woman spacewalk which was quite a milestone to be part of that's it's in there cool. during the mission they're doing the spacewalk and, uh, and some of us got to be in there with it too. So um, that was cool. But what we've heard from, from the people in, in the mission evalu evaluation room and elsewhere is, this is just helpful when you're trying to visualize where things are, particularly where the sun is with respect to the arrays. Oh, yeah. If you're planning a spacewalk, you know, is, uh, is the crew, you know, if you have an astronaut out here, is she gonna be in shadow from the, where the, the sun is? All things you can see from the existing tools you have on computers and elsewhere. But actually, it can be easy to just grab a flashlight and hold it up and, and see what's there. In fact, we have a flashlight we left at home that we labeled the sun. The sun. And we turn it on and just kind of move it around to Well, see. just it generally in 3D modeling itself, a lot of people tell me that while they can 3D model something, having it exist in meat space, 3D printing it, really yeah. lends a bit of realism to it. And, sure. just, and just lets you, that, that tactile feel fills out the rest of the info in your brain. Yeah, and it's been a good visualization tool. So through this project, you're printing things, you're putting things together, you learn a lot more. Plus, you have a lot of inquisitive kids that will keep asking you questions, and you want to know those answers for the next time you're asked. That makes sense. This has been amazing. And just the fact that this is open source and you can have others contribute to its success from around the world really just reinforces the, that idea in my head that, that uh, human space travel is a global effort. It is, and I'm glad you brought that up because I'll say, I say collaboration was key, is key for this and for what we're doing in, in the future. Also, even in this project, collaboration has been key. So I mentioned uh, Boeing, who's been a tremendous supporter of this project, sends us a lot of places. You know, it's, it's all Boeing, it's not all, it's mostly Boeing volunteers <laughs> that are working on this. We're, we're bringing on more people. We're looking for more people. And then also Creator Space uh, is, a, is a nonprofit, all volunteer maker space that's just a little further, a little, uh, it's very near the, the Space Center in Houston. And that's, a, that's where a lot of the funding for this has come through indirectly to help support these educators and others. Um, we just put in a grant that we're really excited about through the ISS National Lab that's gonna help us deploy this in more places. Oh, that's cool. Then we have industry partners like Re3D, which is, uh, you, might, you should come check them out if you're in Houston. They make large scale uh, 3D printers, the local uh, county public library. We were able to community build one of these at the library with patrons students and then the parents came and these are all areas of collaboration between entities that you know they it, they all they all love they love providing these opportunities for people to experience stem in this way right i am geeking out that this is here and i'm so thankful that i saw you at open sauce <laughs> that was so because fun. it led to this here in seattle i want you to look at that camera right there and tell people how they can find out more about this project 
and how they might get involved in helping. We would love for you to join us in this project. Go to issmimic.space. It's just a landing page, but it has a link to our GitHub, our Discord, our YouTube. You can check out what we've got going on there. Jump on the Discord, ask questions. Um, if you want to start, start building one of these yourself, I strongly suggest you ask us first because we're <laughs> continuously updating this. Uh, GitHub does have all the CAD and all the code. We're working on updating our build guide. That's awesome. If you made it this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more. Fight for a cause you believe in. Get yourself to outer space. And as always, high five. High five, it? over. Yeah! Docking yeah! <laughs>